садитесь тоже лотетники включайте, отгоняйте эти шлюпки. Сейчас опускаем, опускаем. Вот. Конечно, вы нас корректируете, если что, потому что мы не видим отсюда нас из-за струи, из-за этого самое не видим, куда сверхнем. Или там на них как-нибудь прямой струю, не знаю, помощнее. Нет, это у нас все, что мы можем. It was the first time I had taken part in a serious climbing activity. And the main challenge we faced was from the Gazprom management, who were instructing the staff to use heavy water cannons at those of us that were occupying the outside of the rig. The Russian Coast Guard were observing what we were doing, and even though the Gazprom management put huge pressure on them to intervene, they refused and observed. Вот понятно, я и хорошо, я тоже обзорю. Просто вас призывают немножко стать так, в таком ракурсе, чтобы было видно, что вот ваши действия тоже мощные, решительные, это направлены. Сейчас вот поставили задачу снимок сделать. Все, где-то в стороне стоите, цветы поливаете. So when we went in 2013, we did expect things to perhaps heat up a bit more, but nobody anticipated the events that were to follow. The massive system rapidly moving across this country tonight. This system already deadly. Holy shit. The nation is on red alert tonight as bushfires rage out of control across the country. A new scientific report has determined the last decade was the warmest on record. Super Typhoon Haiyan has made a direct hit. The wind here is listening. A wake of massive destruction. It's unprecedented, unthinkable. We may have ratified our own doom. It's absolutely clear that climate change is here now. It's very obvious. It's not a debate anymore in the scientific community. It's a clear and present danger. It's getting worse. And unless we act immediately, this is going to foreclose a number of sustainable options in our future. And I think that's a, a horrible legacy to leave for our kids. You could look at the Arctic as, as one of the air conditioners of the planet. Um, it's a very sensitive ecosystem, the Arctic Ocean, in and of itself, but it's also very important in maintaining it as a cold system to protect global climate. The Arctic has been defined as the key environmental challenge of our time. Therefore, it is critically important that as an organization that has the ability to get to the most remote parts of the world, we go out there, bear witness, tell the world what's happening so that we can protect both the unique biodiversity of this part of the world as well as to ensure that what happens in the Arctic does not exacerbate and contribute to accelerating climate change. Sea ice has declined by about half in the last quarter of a century. You know, I'd say by 2030, 10 or 15 years from now, I think there's a very good probability that the Arctic Ocean will be substantially ice-free. As the Arctic sea ice began to melt at a significant level, we saw the beginnings of what could be seen as an Arctic oil rush. Rather than seeing it as a wake-up sign that climate change is real, that we are getting closer and closer to the edge, and the approach is to say, oh wow, the ice is melting, so let's go and see whether we can find some oil and gas there so that we can make the problem of climate change even worse than it is. Um, they see trillions of dollars, and the companies have a lot of sort of bravado about how well they can do it. But a great example for that was 2012 when Shell came to the 
uh, Alaskan Arctic in the Chukchi Sea, trying to drill a couple of top holes with their drilling rig winding up on the beach later on in the year, fires on their vessels, and they were the most intensely scrutinized offshore development probably in the world history. I think everyone in the oil companies knows, and governments really truly know, that it's impossible to respond to a major spill in the Arctic Ocean. It is truly a disaster waiting to happen, and it's a question of when, where, and how bad it will be. However, what we are seeing then is certain Western oil companies believing they can get into the Arctic through lower standards, less safety considerations, and so on, by partnering with Russian oil companies and exploring the Russian Arctic first. These very same companies, like Gazprom and Rosneft and others in Russia, that are promising to drill responsibly offshore are the same companies working onshore, and they have a horrible track record. There are disaster stories throughout Siberia and the Russian Far East. The government has looked the other way, and these companies have gotten away with spill after spill after spill. So we can't trust them to work responsibly offshore, period. So they are now rushing to the Russian Arctic and Gazprom wants to construct dozens more stationary platforms and Rosneft plans to construct more than 100 uh, drilling and survey platforms. Preuslumnia is the first Arctic offshore oil platform to go into production. That's what makes it urgent for us to take action on that place. Um, the platform is in very bad shape and as you can actually see on a video posted by I believe one of the employees of the platform you can literally see a part of the platform being flushed away by a couple of waves and I remember reading one high chief from the company saying well the platform can survive a torpedo strike I mean, it couldn't even survive just a couple of waves a few meters high because already a part of the platform got flushed away. And um, it would be funny if it wouldn't be so serious. So one of the first stages in Arctic drilling is called seismic testing, a method of using sound to map the ocean floor. So when companies all want to know exactly where to drill, they use big sound cannons that send signals down to the ocean floor, very, very loud signals that get reflected back and recorded, and those can be transformed into a map. What's really dangerous about seismic testing is that the sounds made by these cannons are so loud that they can damage fish, birds, uh, whales and other wildlife, as well as um, simply being the preparation for disastrous oil drilling. So now we're entering the northern sea route. Uh, there's a demarcation line at the top of Novaya Zemlya that separates uh, the Barents Sea from the Kara Sea. And we are still about 16 miles off the coast of the north tip of Novaya Zemlya. That puts us in international waters and that gives us the right to innocent passage through these waters. So a day or two after we entered the northern sea route area, we saw a Coast Guard ship approaching us. So we responded that we do not violate any regulations. We are still in, in international waters and we have all the right for free passage, for free navigation in these international waters. Anyway, the Coast Guard vessel uh, demanded to board our Arctic Sunrise and to conduct uh, inspection to make sure that we do not uh, uh, do any illegal activities. You have to immediately stop your vessel and be ready to take my inspection. I refuse to obey. I will take uh, measures uh, right up to prevention fire. 
you are not allowed to come in with gun, you are not allowed to arrest the ship. This is the condition for you to come on board, over. Uh, roger that, Arctic Sunrise. Do you worry about uh, oil spill when you see the operations? Yes, of course. But uh, frankly speaking, it's not our business. But your, your work is safety at sea. And also protect the interests of Russian Federation and Russian mm -hmm. Federation laws and Russian Federation vessels. And oil industry. And also. Stuff. Also. Mm -hmm. So at the end, uh, reluctantly, Argy Sunrise had to leave the area while we were escorted by this Coast Guard ship. And on our way to Kirkenes, we had to make a turn and we got in a very severe storm. So by ourselves, we could see how harsh Arctic can be and how difficult it is even to survive there, live alone, to conduct any uh, technical activities safely. It was quite exciting to come back to the same port and, and see Arctic sunrise down there again. It was very sweet. I remember when we were driving down to the port and, and then I could see a little sunrise there in the water and it just made my heart melt. Well, I have been climbing for Greenpeace for about six years. So, um, yeah, I'm seen as a quite experienced climber. Climbing in protests can be dangerous if you don't know what the risks are. And since I was climbing at Priraslomnaya last year, I knew that the circumstances would be quite hard and even dangerous if we, if we are not prepared for it. Already about 70 miles off, uh, we picked up a shadow on a radar which came closer and closer at great speed, turned out to be a Russian Coast Guard vessel. They hailed us on a VHF and told us that uh, uh, we should not approach Um We spoke back with them and said, well, we are in international waters, we have complete freedom of navigation in this area, we are planning to carry out a peaceful and non-violent protest against the dangerous practice of uh, Arctic oil drilling. Uh, but it was pretty clear that uh, uh, they were very worried and they had strong suspicion that we were approaching Perezlone in order to do an action. Well, suspicion, we told them we would. full understanding that there's no way we'd be able to survive on that oil rig without our own home-built shelter, otherwise known as Pod 3. Uh, the plan was to get the pod up onto the side of the oil rig and to halt the production of oil. We believe that your platform and the activities being carried out in preparation for drilling for oil in the Arctic Ocean represents a real and immediate threat to the environment both here and globally. We started being chased everywhere we went, everywhere we tried to get a line-up. We only had a few minutes within which to get climbers up underneath that heavy platform. But it was a chase and we were losing time rapidly. Uh, I managed to get a rope up and I started to climb up on it. Um, but just when I was attaching myself to the rope, uh, the Coast Guard boat came and, and started pushing our boat away. Uh, they realized we were going to continue and we we're going to try our hardest to get a climber onto that rig. 
and uh, they had made a decision that was not going to happen. And they drew guns and they pointed it straight in my face. Yeah, Uh, I used to be a war photographer in a, in a Reuters and agency France Press and uh, when I saw these aggressive uh, soldiers I knew the main point now is not only the hanging the banner but I had to take photos how they pointed the gun at, at the Greenpeace activists. It was such a bizarre thing to see a gun pointing at you that I I maybe couldn't even take it seriously because it just felt so wrong. We were there doing a peaceful protest, we were not threatening anyone or anything, and they come there with their guns. A couple of the ribs at this point already um, were damaged by the knives of the, of the FSB guards, so we're returning to Arctic Sunrise. Um, and it was at that point that uh, the situation started really getting out of control. Two climbers, they were on a mooring line, were being attacked both by water hoses from the platform, uh, as well as by the, the Coast Guard that were in the ribs underneath them. There was no stop in the water sp sprayed on us and I just got this thought in my head that okay this is not good it's getting really dangerous we are not achieving anything anymore and then I could feel Crusoe shaking and I, I realized that he is getting hypothermia They wanted me to come down, but they didn't realize that when they hold the rope, I can't come down. So I was stuck there. And it was quite scary because then I really realized that I don't have a way to communicate to them. Whatever I say, they were not listening to me. So in the end, I was just like shouting that I'm coming down and tried to pull the rope so that I could get some slack so that I could actually go down. And I think the more the other ribs could see that Cindy was distressed and they could hear it in her voice, the more they tried to assist. And the nearer they came in, the more angry the FSB ribs became and the FSB agents on board became much more aggressive. So at this point the action is over, however we have two people who are on board the Coast Guard ship basically being held as hostages, is how we interpret it. Arctic Sunrise, uh, you stop your vessel or heave to. Uh, if you don't do this, presently is taking decision on stop your vessel with using weapons. I understand what you're saying. Please understand what you're threatening to do. It's not just a legal matter, sir. I think this is also a matter for your conscience. We repeat it again and again. What you are actually threatening to do is a clear breach of international law. What you're actually doing is technically an act of war against Netherlands, whose flag our ship is flying. You are an armed warship in international waters and you're threatening to shoot at an unarmed vessel. So after some time when I was on board on the Coast Guard ship and I was sitting in the mess room, there was this kind of uh, internal radio where apparently the captain of the ship was just shouting and he was repeating one word a couple of times. And after that I could, I could feel and hear the whole ship shaking. And I realized that, oh my god, they are using the cannons. And I think 
altogether about 10 or 11 times. They uh, fired shots across the bow of the ship, coming closer and closer and closer. Sunrise. This is Russian Cold God ship. Um, as I suspect you in terrorism. In terrorism? In terrorism? I'm sending an inspection party to you. I'm sending an inspection party to you. And the Coast Guard made it pretty clear they wanted to board us. They sent a, a boat over at some point, but we didn't feel they had the right to board us on the high seas. And uh, that was pretty frustrating for them. And I think that's one of the reasons why they reacted so strongly the next day was because we, we ignored them. I was uh, sitting in a... Um in the mess, I remember, I think we were just uh, finishing up lunch, when I heard a lot of screaming and running around in, uh, uh, in the corridors outside. People shouting, helicopters coming, helicopters coming. I ran out on deck, and uh, from that moment on, I was in the middle of a James Bond movie. Well, when the boarding happened, I was actually down on the, an exercise machine in the hold, and I heard the engine stop. And about a minute later, uh, some panic-stricken crew member came running up and got, oh my God, they're jumping out of a helicopter. I thought, oh. I ran out on the heli deck and uh, I saw the first of, uh, of this uh, masked, camouflage-clad, heavily armed troopers slide down the, the wire onto the deck of the Arctic Sunrise, started shouting at us in Russian, uh, telling us to get down, get down on the deck. Guns were being pointed more or less in the direction of the people. I turned around and I ran for the bridge. Um, as I was running up the steps, I saw Frank standing in front of the door and I saw him being uh, pulled back and thrown down to the ground by another trooper. Um, I stopped in front of his body and then I felt a hand on my shoulder pulling me back and then shoving me forward and I stumbled and fell onto Frank's prone body. For me, it felt like old times. It didn't feel like anything like a surprise. Oh, we're being boarded by armed guys. Okay, what else is new? And, uh, you know, it turned into a long evening. I mean, they put some Coast Guard guys on board to take over the ship, and eventually we told them we weren't uh, going to motor the ship back to Murmansk ourselves. They were going to have to tow us. And they said, okay, well, we'll have to tow you. And that's what they did. High drama on the high seas today. Russian security forces have seized control of the sunrise. The activists had vorgestern on the high seas against the Greenpeace says two New Zealanders are among a group of the Greenpeace says this was an entirely peaceful protest. The only danger here is the oil platform. Hay preocupación por los jóvenes with the news that they believe to be from the Russian security service. Well, after the ship was towed to uh, to Murmansk and uh, were anchored off in a, in a Kola Bay, um, after a few hours, uh, we were told that we are to be taken off the ship in two groups, and uh, this would take maybe a few hours, and we'll be back on a ship. And, um, well, first we were taken on two ships of the Coast Guard, and then when we arrived on land, we were the group was split in two um, and transferred in buses to the office. Uh, we drove through the night Murmansk streets, 
Um, couldn't see much out the window. We came into the investigation committee's uh, main building in Murmansk, saw for the first time uh, some camera flashes. And I remember a lot of media was standing outside, and then I was beginning to realize that there was quite a story going on about us. As we were walking in through the metal detector, uh, each of us was sort of grabbed by a civilian man who said, I'm your lawyer, answer no questions, sign nothing, and then we're whisked all away. And at some point the translator came in and she called my name and I was one of the first to be taken for, I thought, interrogation. Uh, we're taken out one by one uh, and, uh, and taken to, uh, to an interrogator uh, who told us what we're being suspected of. And this is the first time that I heard the word piracy. We expected to get to Mormansk, pay an administrative fine, which we did pay, uh, and then leave for, for Norway. We just never had a clue they would try to charge us in piracy. That was just, that's where the, the train came off the tracks. It was a bit like a punch in the stomach, like, what? Piracy for what? For waving a banner around on the water in international waters next to a giant construction? When, when I first heard about uh, uh, about uh, this charge of piracy, I looked at uh, my investigator and asked him again, well, have you read the article yourself? And then I understood that our case has nothing to do with the law. It has nothing to do with the, anything, you know, within common sense. That absurdity has no limits. One by one, we were taken to the court. And our lawyer came down to break the news that the first have been arrested for two months. And then I stopped breathing for a moment. Being led into this court in my prison clothes that I hadn't changed since I'd been in prison. And you're put in this cage, and everybody in court's looking at you, and you feel like a criminal. It felt very unreal, and I have to admit, I was feeling bad then. I was very worried and afraid, not for a couple of weeks or a couple of months of jail, but afraid what would happen to us. Would, would we be convicted for piracy? You know, on one hand, rationally, anywhere short of, you know, North Korea, this will not stick, that they, they cannot lock up 30 peaceful people from 19 or whatever different countries for many years on an accusation as absurd as this. And yet at the same time, here's this very serious man in a very serious uniform in a very serious office telling me absolutely seriously that he is convinced that I have committed this crime and that he will do everything in his power, which is not insubstantial, to make sure that I spend next 10 to 15 years of my life behind bars. So to get called a pirate in that situation, when you're looking at 10 to 15 years in jail, that's a very scary thing. And you can't help but believe at some point the prosecutor's gonna to come to his senses or the investigator's gonna change the charge, especially after President Putin had come out and said they're not pirates. And you're thinking, you know, somebody's gotta be kidding. They're not gonna put 30 people in jail for two months. And that night I was in jail. And I remember being taken out the van and I saw this very crappy building that looked like falling apart, two dogs barking. And um, I remember Manus being quite optimistic and he said, you know, it's going to be fine. It's going to take a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, but I have good hope. And I said, you know, I'm not feeling it right now. You know, a couple of weeks of prison, yeah, we're going to survive that. But what's going to happen after that? Will we be stuck here for years uh, as innocent people? It was pretty late. It was around 11 or 12 o'clock when we arrived there. So it was quite a scary moment because you didn't know what to expect. And uh, there were some police taking us there. 
And when I saw the look on their faces when they left us there, it made me really worried. Well, when I first arrived at the prison, I saw these giant, tall metal gates and the rows of barbed wire. I could hear the barking of the dogs. And there was this man with a, in a, in a sky blue camouflage uniform who said to us in this voice that was a voice of absolute control. He said, welcome to your new home. You'll be spending quite a long time here. I'll happily admit, I was scared in prison. There, it was there. I know I felt fear. No question. I know I lost 10 kilos in three weeks because I was weighing myself on the scale. And it wasn't the food. It was just the stress. Well, you know that uh, the conditions in prison are, especially in Russian prisons, are very tough. And you are really, really scared about that. But I think that um, it was the initial moment. Then I found it out that, uh, well, even in jail, people are just human beings. And even if they are charged with the severe charges, they can be really good, well, neighbors. They can be even friends. They can be very supportive. So the hardest thing for me was not the neighbors, nor the conditions of the cell. The, the most terrible thing was uh, this sense of uncertainty. Why I'm here and what will come next. In Russia, it's very easy to detain a person. So criminal suspects, in majority of cases, will be detained for the period of investigation. And once someone is a criminal suspect, in most cases, they will get convicted. It was clear that from the perspective of the Russian authorities, they wanted to hold them indefinitely. These were not really legal proceedings. A political decision had been taken, uh, this was, if you like, a kind of show trial uh, rather than anything that would be expected in a proper court of law. I think they wanted to punish us. I think some big decisions have been made quite high up to teach Greenpeace a lesson, to teach any NGO prepared to take direct action or to protest in Russia that they were not to be messed with. Мы знаем тут громкие дела того же Ходорковского, Пуси Райт и так далее. Поэтому это, мне кажется, одно из событий в череде тех, что происходит. И это очень хорошо показывает то, как Россия, говоря о том, что это демократическая страна, такой не является. Дело Артик Санрайс это политическое, политическое дело. И Для меня это, очевидно, некое предупреждение на будущее, а, возможно, Гринпис или кому-то еще, или третьим странам, Артика наша, и не суйте сюда. Это, как мне кажется, для, для, для президента Российской Федерации и вообще России, Артика – это такое дитя, которое они взращивают, считая, что это будет некой точкой роста для, для, для всего российского общества и российской экономики, как в свое время был космос для, для Советского Союза. Два! Три! I think this moment was particularly sensitive for Russia with the Olympic Games coming, with Russia facing increasing pressure internationally over, over its human rights record. It must have been terribly annoying that some foreigners come to what Russia regards as its territory and the habit dictated that they had to be dealt with harshly. Now, uh, they don't want to be seen acting under pressure, but clearly that pressure does make a difference, and I, I think it was making the whole situation very awkward for Russia. The level of solidarity and support for the Arctic 30 was moving, inspirational and humbling. 
We had every country in the world, people standing up and speaking out. We had the human rights and other NGOs standing shoulder to shoulder with us. We had religious leaders and trade movements standing with us. And we also got support from quarters that we don't always do, and that is from uh, heads of state calling President Putin and putting pressure on him, uh, as well as from very well-known arts and culture celebrities. campaigning on last year and they walked away and obviously if it's a rig it's not a vessel and if it's not a vessel then they can't be pirates. Finally I was actually getting some letters and I realised in that fact they were starting to build a fairly big worldwide campaign of support for the Arctic 30 and demands for our release. And that was a wonderful feeling. My consuls came and visited me and they just kept coming with these stories and first it was ten thousands of people, then hundreds of thousands, then two million people that signed a petition calling for our release and that was so touching and moving. People were thanking us and saying that we are heroes and, and we have done so much for the climate and for the Arctic. We can avoid disasters, climate change, and we can save the Arctic because there are so many people around the world who care and who care really a lot and are ready to do many things and and just yeah, just the feeling of this solidarity, it really it really gave me so much hope. Tens of millions of people around the world who had never even thought about the Arctic before, who didn't know exactly where the Arctic was to start with, were beginning to say, why is this important? Why would these people take the risks that they did to draw our attention to what is happening? And at the end of the day, it's clear to us, it is that people power that showed the Russian authorities that they would have to tread carefully about how they actually treat the case of the Arctic 30. Wszyscy, którzy znają Rosję współczesną, Rosję putinowską, wiedzą, że ci działacze nie zostali tam aresztowani za to, że przedsięwzięli jakąś akcję, tylko że to jest akcja polityczna. And it is in verhoudingen tussen de Europese Unie en de Russische Republiek onaanvaardbaar. We should certainly not lose sight from the issue that they were attracting attention to. Diese gewaltfreie Aktion sollte ein Signal sein, nicht nur an Russland, sondern auch an den Rest der Welt für unsere Verantwortung für das, was dort passiert. Excusez-moi, mais Gazprom n'est pas encore le 29e État de l'Union européenne. Et moi, j'attends que les institutions européennes soient beaucoup plus fortes et que les États européens enfin disent à Monsieur Poutine et à Gazprom qu'ils ne font pas n'importe quoi. Clearly the political pressure, as well as public pressure, was beginning to mount in this case. And we had, of course, at that time, the King of the Netherlands was about to make his first state visit to the Russian Federation. And it therefore took quite a lot of diplomatic courage, I think, for the Netherlands to say, we are going to take this case to the International Tribunal on the law of the sea. The Dutch government was taking an unprecedented step. No one had ever challenged the authority of the Russians to invade a ship in this way. And uh, it was something that I think the Russians never calculated on happening. And they made, I think, the very foolish mistake of boycotting the proceedings.
Bavel, my lawyer, suggested that hooliganism was um, being touted as the charge that we were going to probably face in court if and when it went to court. And uh, that was worrying because piracy was clearly, utterly fiction. With hooliganism, we felt worried because we felt they'd actually thought about what they were doing now. And that was a nasty change. Well, I personally think that uh, what they were doing, they were doing without not giving any second thought to what happens next. So it was an immediate sort of, you know, emotional reaction. Well, fuck them up. But what happens next? Then they started thinking how to get out of the situation. How to get out of this situation without losing their face. We hadn't actually seen our lawyers for over two weeks during the transition from Murmansk. In actual fact, the first time I got to see anybody was the British consul. The bad news was that the IC, the investigative committee, had actually applied for a three-month extension. And he leant forward and he said, um, maybe this is time for an apology. This is a time to apologise to the Russian government. Indeed, that was the advice from quite a few Russian experts, that the only way out of there was going to be a full apology on our behalf by Greenpeace or by us ourselves. And I'm so glad he said that because apology. I remember it just absolutely stiffened all of my resolve. And I thought, apology? Man, we don't apologise for trying to save the Arctic. That's exactly, fundamentally, what we're here for. Well, when we got down to St. Petersburg, we started to get visited by some really high officials with just stuff glittering off their shoulders. And I mean, I don't know what they were, but they were, they were high. And uh, uh, he came in, spoke good English. First, he spoke to my roommate and said, what are you here for? And my roommate said, drugs. And the guy said, you're toast. And then he looked at me and said, how are things going? And I said, you tell me, how are things going? And he said, oh, your problems will be over very soon. It was just amazing, like, really the best moment of my life. It felt like being newborn or something. I felt like I looked in the picture. I was full of smiles, really happy, really, really keen to get away from the prison and really, really keen to have my freedom. I am not glad that I spent two months in prison for sure, but uh, it is clear that this whole period, the action and the follow-up, the result of it has gone way, way beyond our wildest dreams.
Ну, очень хорошо, конечно, глотнуть свободы, без вопроса. We have now been able to speak to an audience, the people we have never been able to talk to before. We have raised the problem of the melting Arctic, or the threat of the oil drilling, or the threat of the climate change in the minds that were close to us before. You know, I think this present day and time is a crossroads for the future of the Arctic. And I think 50 years from now, looking back to 2014, 2015, in this period, will be seen historically as the time that we either laid down the, the correct path for the Arctic, or we blew it and applied the same model, dysfunctional model that we've applied elsewhere. So I think this is the time to get this thing right, and we don't quite have it yet. What we are seeing is that a foundation has been laid for us to be in with a chance of getting all governments in the world to work together to declare the upper Arctic a global sanctuary with no industrial activity taking place. The, the proposal to establish a high Arctic sanctuary is great. Uh, it could be patterned perhaps off the Antarctic Treaty where nations of the world said we need to set this area aside free from military and commercial development in the, for the future of all humankind. They did, it's a remarkable success and the same possibility needs to be explored for the Arctic. When people started talking about the Antarctica being declared a global sanctuary, there were lots of people said unrealistic, impossible. We can do the same to declare the upper Arctic a global sanctuary with no industrial activity and I'm sure history will record that part of that success when we win it will be as a result of the contribution made Excellent. by the Arctic City. I just signed my uh, document that says that the case is dropped due to the amnesty that was recently uh, that recently passed through the Duma. So um, this finally means it's over. It's over. Несколько минут назад объявлено о начале поставок нефти, добытой на российском арктическом шельфе в Печорском море. К отправке с платформы «Приразломная» готовится первый танкер. Это, по сути, начало большой масштабной работы нашей страны в Арктике по добыче минеральных ресурсов, по добыче нефти. Будет укреплять экономику в целом и нашу энергетическую отрасль. Уважаемый Владимир Владимирович, отгрузка первой нефти с платформы «Приразломная» успешно начата. Нефть поступает на танкер Михаил Ульянов. Поздравляю вас и всех коллег с этим большим успехом. Спасибо большое. We came to the Arctic to protect the Arctic. When they start oil drilling, it will affect the entire planet. So I want my kid to see and to know that polar bears are not just on pictures or in a zoo, that there is Northern Pole, that there is ice, that there is Antarctica, that there are other parts of the world. Why on earth should we destroy all this just within, you know, two, three, four generations. Coming up on the left. Yeah, this is our tanker. The Mikhail Ulyanov. Hello, our friend. When I started out doing environmental work 40 years ago, there is a at least for me, a big, from a sense of optimism that this was a job we could tackle and win. 
And here we are 40 years later, and now I am just scared for the future of my kids, and that's just no exaggeration. Scientists are telling us we can't burn the oil we already have. We don't want to cook the planet. Rainbow Warrior, Rainbow Warrior, this is the police speaking. I hereby order you to stay clear of the Russian vessel entering Rotterdam right now. Even during my darkest moments uh, in prison, uh, there wasn't a single moment I regretted to take action to save the Arctic. I knew what I was up against, and if this is what they want to do to me and the others to intimidate us, well, that's one thing, but I'm not going to stop campaigning to protect the Arctic. Mass entrance. This is Greenpeace. We are doing a peaceful action against the Mikhail Uyanov. We will not interfere with its navigation, and we do a peaceful action. Mikhail Uyanov, Rainbow Warrior. Please be aware we have swimmers in the water. We have swimmers in the water. Giving up's not an option. Turning the Arctic over to a gas farm is not an option. We have to tell them, stop. Enough is enough, and I would do it again. I'm not backing down. Lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. Everyone in and off the bridge. Yeah, I see. I, I am.